Good evening. I'm Clayton Jones, your uh, host for tonight's Drugs, Crime, and Politics. It's brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas, and uh, it is helped with a normal group of Houston. And tonight we have Dean Becker. Unfortunately, uh, Buford is not a little bit under the weather this week, so I'm glad you could come on. I'm sure we've got plenty to talk about. I'm sorry oh, to hear about Buford as well. Get, get well soon, old friend. Uh, we need you back. But uh, there's lots popping, lots happening in the drug world. Yeah. Um, about 10 days ago, there was an anniversary on a, uh, about a farm. Yeah, a lot of folks have uh, forgotten this, if they ever knew it at all, and that was that uh, in the week preceding 9-11 of 2001, there were two gentlemen, uh, Tom Croslin, Raleigh Rome, they, they had a campground they called uh, Rainbow Farm. And it was uh, there near Vidalia, Michigan. They would have what they called the, the roach roast and uh, other cannabis-related events uh, on, on special holidays, Labor Day in particular. And uh, as the years went by, the local uh, politicians objected. They thought that this was wrong. They wanted to bring it to an end, so they... Uh, uh, th threatened uh, to take away their the son. Th these were two men, Tom Cross and Raleigh Rome. They were they were lovers. They were yeah. gay. They they uh, but were uh, very influential there in Michigan in awakening people to the need to change the drug laws, in particular the marijuana laws. But uh, the the uh, local authorities threatened to take away their farm, to take away the son. And then one uh, day in May of 2001, they actually waited for the bus to come by and drop off the son, Robert Rome. He did not get off the bus. The authorities had taken him uh, and put him in uh, a foster home where the, a cop was the, the father of that home. They, they were going to straighten him out, give him the right morals. But anyway, they, they, they then uh, filed papers to take the farm, to take away Rainbow Farm from this, this mm -hmm. group. and. Um, Tom and Raleigh said, well, we're not going to leave the buildings. We're not going to leave anything here but scorched earth. And uh, the police came by the droves. Actually, 50 FBI agents showed up at this event because they, they say they shot at a helicopter, which they then made it a federal crime. But in the weeks leading up to 9-11, there were 50 FBI agents at a pot farm, right? Uh, you talk about waste of proper resources. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, about uh, six days before 9-11, Tom Croslin walked out on the porch of the little home they had there on the farm. Uh, he saw a sniper, an FBI sniper, in the trees, and he raised his weapon, started to raise his weapon. They shot through the stock of his weapon and into his, as I remember now, into his head. Uh, killed him instantly. Uh, the next morning, they made arrangements for Raleigh Rome, the, the father of the Robert who had been taken yeah. by the FBI, to surrender. He was supposed to surrender at 7 a.m., but at 6 a.m., the house he was in caught on fire. He came outside with his weapon and was shot, this time through the stock of the rifle and into his chest. As I understand it, he was then shot two more times while he was on the ground. And they say that when they... Uh, uh, Raleigh uh, Rome's family did a, a, you know, a family autopsy, not the state autopsy. Yep. They discovered, yes, three bullet wounds and his testicles had been removed. Uh, this is the type of thing that, that, that shows the squandering of our treasury, the wasting of manpower and effort, focus, time, energy that we put into this drug war. You were talking about uh, th those numbers worldwide now, that are being expended in trying to stop the flow. Now, here in the United States, we spend about $60 billion total a year right. on this drug war, incarceration, law enforcement. It, Europe itself spends about $70 billion. And throughout the, um, the world, it's estimated at between two and $300 billion a year is spent on this uh, drug war. Uh, Five hundred billion dollars is a lot of money. Three hundred billion dollars is a lot of money. 
Well, let me, let me throw into that equation. I was at a conference in El Paso, Texas. It's now been two and a half years ago, where Anthony Placido, he's the assistant administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration, mm -hmm. and he stated there on stage, a major speech at this, this gathering, that uh, the United States uh, has recognized the, the, uh, the, the flow, the amount of money that goes to these people we're trying to stop, to the terrorists, yes. to the cartels, yeah. to the violent gangs prowling our neighborhood. All of these bad actors reap $385 billion a year. So we're, we're spending two, three hundred billion to stop the flow. At the same time, these people, these, these barbarous criminals are making $385 billion a year. <coughs> Where is the benefit? What have we derived well, that offsets this horrible blowback? The, Look, I mean, we've got the same damn thing happening right here in this country. You have policemen in Tennessee, state policemen, the state drug t uh, task force. They will not stop a vehicle going north, even if they know how much marijuana it's carrying. They want to get on the way back because if they get marijuana, it only costs them money to uh, get rid of it. They want to get the money be, uh, instead. They want the drugs sold, they want the money accumulated, then they want, that's when they want to make their bust. Well, and the, the point there too, Clay, is to, to recognize that the, uh, the money going south is going to the cartels, yes. or it's going to banks in Texas where they launder the money on behalf of the cartels. But, but I, I, what I want to get to here is that the, the, the focus, as you say, is not on the drugs. They really couldn't care less about the drugs in the, for the most part. Most right. people recognize now that drugs are not the problem that alcohol is. Drugs are not the problem that tobacco is. But they also recognize it's how they make their mortgage payment. And as you say, when that money's going south, That's then they put their hands well, on it. The, then the state gets to keep 40%. Right. They, they, they have their own laundering system. They oh, send yeah. it to the federal government. The federal government rubber stamps it and says, here's your 40%, boys. Texas is the number one forfeiture state in the country. We do more forfeitures in Texas than anywhere else in the country, financially. All this forfeiture money was designated to go to the state education fund. But the way local police forces uh, circumvent that is they go through the U.S. District Attorney for the uh, foreclosure instead of the state. Right. That way, it comes back to them, and the feds get their money, and the state and the educational system gets nothing. Pays salaries, pays for new cars, pays for new weapons, uh, pays for big parties sometimes and, as well. And there's been so many of these uh, task force directors that says, well, we're after the money. Yeah. We well, need the money in order to keep our task force going. So it says, we don't care about how many drugs are being used. I, we don't care if there's... 1,700 people die overdose a year? Right. Uh, illegal drugs, is that the right number? 17? No, I'd say 17,000. 17,000 yes. people. It's, they're not worried about that. No. It's all about money. It's all about the dollar. Right. It, now we're getting into law enforcement for profit. Well, you, you know, Clay, right here in Houston, it's now been four years back. There was one weekend where a bunch of cocaine users went to their sellers, bought their weekly purchase, took it home. Um, either snorted it, shot it up, whatever. Whatever, whatever their method is, and it killed them. And there was 14 young people, I say young, they were between 18 and age 35, mm -hmm. died that weekend, thinking they were, sh they were shooting or using cocaine, when the truth of it is, the distributor was a smart distributor, he didn't even use the product. He mm -hmm. just sold what the cartel gave him. Uh, but it turns out it was not cocaine, it was 85% heroin. And it killed those young people because they didn't know what they were buying. What's in the bag. What's in the bag. And that's, that's responsible for more overdose than, than anything. It's the fact that people don't know what they're buying. Some, some weeks it's 10%, some weeks it's 90%. And if you do the same amount on that 90%, 90% you're, you're going right. to kill yourself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, I mean, it's absolutely it's, crazy. I, this, this past week I, I had a, an article I had uh, uh, published in the Alternet talked about the fact that uh, I've now for 10 years sought a, a discussion 
with mm -hmm. the drugs are, the head of the ONDCP or the head of the DEA, to come on my radio show and clarify the need. Ex explain for us, what is the benefit? What have we derived that more than offsets this horrible blowback? And of course, they won't do it. And I, and I stated as much that really they, they like to stand by uh, on the bully pulpit. They like to stand there, you know, uh, with, <coughs> with unsavory snitches and, uh, you know, threat of long-term incarceration and always with a high-powered weapon at the ready mm -hmm. because that way uh, fewer people are going to object when they spout bullshit. Well, the one thing that they can say that's, I guess it's their accomplishment, drugs are more plentiful. Oh, yeah. They cost a lot less. <laughs> and they're a lot more concentrated. They are. For the most part, they are. It's uh, So... I guess that when this six-man commission that gets into um, budget cutting, hmm. it's supposed to be cutting budgets of things that aren't working, right? aren't uh, doing what they're supposed to do. I guess the, the marijuana money is just going to have to get eliminated, or they're, they're just not going to be able to... Well, I, I, it's, it's nice to think positive, but the fact of the matter is since Obama came his administration that was put in place, they have actually reinstated the task force grant money for folks like those in Tulia mm -hmm. that arrested 41 blacks in one weekend despite not finding any drugs, money, or guns. Uh, they were the, black. Well, they were black, you're right, I'm sorry. But the, <laughs> the, the, the point I'm getting at is that hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that Obama made available again to reinstate those task forces which have no government oversight there's no district attorney over them there's no sheriff running it it's a task force that that draws from other agencies yes. but they are their own uh, decision makers and they decide who they're gonna bust and what property they're gonna forfeit and how they're gonna make their money yes that's it entirely I mean it's almost like there's an industry and money to be made here as policemen. Right. And we're doing our job. That's how they feed their children. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I had a unique experience while I was out in Oakland a uh, week and a half ago. They had a big cannabis event there, you know, with uh, all kinds of things going on. And one of the people that I met there was uh, one of uh, my band of brothers, law enforcement against prohibition. And his name was Jeff Studdard. Jeff was a uh, long-term Los Angeles County deputy sheriff. For, for many years, he got a back injury. He retired. But now he run, he's part half owner of an outfit called Medicone. And what they do is make these six-inch marijuana cigarettes that are kind of cone-shaped. Cone. And, and they sell them mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, adults uh, with, a, with a medical marijuana recommendation. They're in the state of California. And I, I was out there... Uh, you know, to report for my, my radio shows. And I think we got a little video that uh, may, maybe we could play a part of. I, I could tell you what we're looking at if, if you'd like to do okay. that. Um, Steve, do you think you could uh, cue that up for us? I, I think in the, in the first segment we're going to see, it's uh, just a, a shot of the location, if you will, you know, where it was held. Uh, was it in front of Richard's shop? Well, no, it was about a block and a half from Richard's shop. But... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that in states like California and, and Colorado in particular, where things are mm, accepted, you know, that there's, there's less amount of police or district attorney resistance, that uh, most of the bigger cities have figured it out. There are still problems in California, like with San Diego and uh, uh, other cities where the local uh, city councils or whatever ha have somebody that that objects and really wants to throw a, a you know a, a monkey wrench into things. Wasn't San Diego the county that was continually trying to fight the law? Uh, oh yes. In the courts, uh, one appeal after another after another, and they had spent millions of dollars trying to fight it already. Yeah, and and I think they actually did lose the oh the the predominant plank in their in their idea. But uh, they still have the same actors, the Republican, conservative, Christians, I would imagine, that are, are fighting it, you know, willing to spend the, the state and county dollars uh, no matter the cost. 
Um, we're ready to go? Okay, Steve, Steve says he's got that ready, but uh, we, we can kind of talk over this, but I, I wanted you to see, uh, first off, what, uh, where it was. We going, Steve? Here we go. Yeah, this is the International Cannabis and Hemp Expo. Uh, it was held uh, Labor Day weekend uh, out there. And if you look closely, it says City, City Hall. Hall. The front steps of City Hall there in Oakland, California, major uh, city there. And, and if you, a little later, you'll, you'll get a better idea of what's going on. This is the main stage. That's the left edge or the furthest edge of that main stage. This is giving you a look at it the day before the event, the way they had it set up. But all of this is uh, oh, right there in, uh, in front of Oakland's uh, City Hall. I don't know. I'm not the world's best videographer. There's a medi something, some kind of medical marijuana van hauling uh, some goods, I'm sure. Um, but you got to realize this area in front of City Hall was designated. They had kind of a two-part, uh, no grass on the grass, they said. <laughs> grass. But this, this was kind of a, a, a two-part event. There was this area right in front of City Hall, which was where adults could smoke marijuana. You didn't even have to be a medical patient to smoke marijuana in the area in front of City Hall. Now, if you go outside, there was a gate you had to go through, and there's more vendors back behind there that are in front of the State Accounting Office for California. The State Accounting Office is directly behind this building, City Hall, and... Uh, uh, but outside the city hall area, you weren't supposed to smoke marijuana. But inside this area, uh, they, they were, uh, this is one of the vendors that was outside, no, no marijuana in there, but these jars are apothecary jars from the uh, uh, early part of the 20th century, late part of the uh, 19th century, which contained cannabis. It was a recognized, legitimate, everyday used medicine, as you mm -hmm. well know, Clay. And uh, I talked to this lady uh, about it here. She's uh, explaining to me a lot about those jars, what the, the prices are and how they're infused, that those are not labels, they're inside the glass and all this kind of stuff. You know, back when America did a lot of quality craftsmanship work. Uh, I think we still do. Oh, well, we do in a lot of ways, but uh, we've given a lot of manufacturing to other countries, and we need to take some of that back. We got a lot of kids that need to go to work. That's right. Uh, we certainly do. But uh, I, I guess the point I, w I was wanting to get at here is that inside this area, uh, no, not this area, this was outside the smoking area, but in the smoking area, they were selling the very best cannabis that one can imagine. People strive and try their hardest, as you know, out in California to create the best and strongest, newest strain. And they were selling, I guarantee you, hundreds of strains uh, of marijuana in that area in front of City Hall uh, in Oakland. Um, they were selling cookies and extracts and tinctures and um, lotions and balms and <coughs> salves and every kind of way you can use the cannabis product. There was a product for sale in that area in, in front of City Hall. Now, while I was there, I got a chance to talk to the policeman, which the police never stepped foot inside that city hall area. They patrolled the other area and outside the venue. But uh, I asked them on the uh, end of the second and final day, how, how many problems have you had? Uh, what kind of situations did you run into? They said, this has been clean as a whistle. There hasn't been one problem whatsoever. And Oakland is known as a rough and tough city. Oh, it is. Well, Oakland is uh, not uh, the murder capital of the, of the U.S., but it has its problems. But, but in this venue, there was nothing but mellow people. And again, I want to stress this. I wish CBS had been there with their cameras. I, w I wish Fox had been there with their cameras to see these people smoking the very best that the world has to offer, to take in every bit of cannabis that a human being can hold, mm -hmm. and still have a pretty normal day, great discussions, progress, and, you know, creativity going on. And uh, I, I, I guess the, the point so many people fail to recognize or to even think about is that getting high, especially on marijuana, is nothing like getting drunk. drunk. It, it doesn't make you stumble or mumble or fumble. Doesn't make you belligerent. Uh, doesn't make you angry. Nope. It might make you creative, might make you laugh your butt off, but it's, it's not going to lead to any kind of mayhem or madness. And I, I guess that's, that's the thing that 
needs to be stressed, needs to be known, recognized, and, and embraced is that we, we have been lying to ourselves for 100 years now, well, since 1937 federally, since uh, about 1914, uh, according to the states. Texas was one of the first to make marijuana illegal because they wanted to have a means whereby they could arrest those Mexicans. And, and uh, black people, too. And, well, yeah, but arrest those Mexicans and keep them from taking our jobs. And that's still kind of what's going on. Do you know in the um, United States, the arrest ratio between white people going to jail for marijuana and black people going to jail for marijuana? It's uh, about... One to 15. Yeah, and six to one on the, for uh, Hispanics to, to whites, I think. It's crazy. <laughs> now, the, this, this scene we're looking at here, this is one of the bands. And again, they're playing directly in front of City Hall. The people, the politicians of Oakland recognize that they're bringing in millions of dollars in taxes. They're, uh, they're getting permit money for all the the uh, uh, dispensaries that are setting up, they're getting, uh, they're benefiting from this. They, they, they're not seeing the downside that the government tries to tell us is there. It, it's just not happening. Well, California, Colorado, and Maine have been out in the front of all this. Right. Um, now, here's the, let me talk about this. This is the, the busy day. And I'm not going to name names or anything, but there's some stuff going on here, some sales being made, some stuff being smoked. They, they told us they didn't want the cameras, uh, oh, too noticeable. They didn't want to scare people. They wanted to make it friendly and relaxed. And so I, I just took these few shots uh, to, uh, you know, g give folks an idea of, of what it's like. This, this is a cannabis expo. I guarantee you, every one of these people is stoned if you want to call it that. Stone means feeling groovy. It doesn't mean drunk and mumbling or fighting. It just means uh, enjoying the day. Uh, the day I left Houston, it was 107 degrees. The day I got to uh, Oakland, it was 67 degrees. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine, yeah, and again, I'm zooming in on the, the city hall here. I want to show folks this is, this is what's going on. This is uh, a, a much better scenario. Instead of wasting money, chasing down drugs instead of wasting money giving it to criminals they're saving money by taxing it and regulating and let adults do what adults have always done anyway let's face it it would be better for all of our society if all drugs were legal you betcha um, for two dollars a day what actual cost of a heroin is for a day we have robberies burglaries murders all over this two dollars a day that it could be yeah but yeah. instead our black market makes it hundred two hundred three hundred dollars a day yep. um, and, and it costs uh, at least half that to, to put somebody in jail for the day so w where is the benefit again where is it, it it's a losing <coughs> proposition all the way around I mean here in uh, Texas in 2007 they uh, passed that law that said that uh, if you had four ounces or less yep. on you, yep. uh, if you wrote bad checks up to $500. Even graffiti. Graffiti up to a value of $500, that uh, if the court is set up in your county so that uh, they can give you a citation, not even bring you to court, bring you to jail, right. do all night long trying to get through the jail stuff, um, write you a citation, and you have three days to report to jail. You know, th there was a uh, uh, synopsis done on this, and I think in Texas, the only county to take advantage of this change in law, to, to make use of this change in law, was Travis County. And even there, and I can't remember which, the sheriff's department uses it and the, the police department doesn't, but it's not even 100% there. It's up mm -hmm. to the arresting official you know, uh, status to, to determine if they want to do that. And the fact of the matter is, in Texas each year we have tens of thousands of marijuana arrests, and yet we... we I believe it's 77,000. Well, 77. Uh, well, tens and tens then, I don't know. But so many that they, they choose to put the cuffs on, they choose 
to take to the jail. They choose to fill out the paperwork on it. They choose to take that officer off the beat where he could be going after violent or dangerous criminals. And, uh, and yet, what is the benefit? What have we derived? You know, the harm that is done from that, first you've got a young person, let's suppose, that is, now has a drug charge on them. Um, they're not going to be able to rent an apartment in their own name. That's it. They're not going to be able to get much more than a minimum wage job. Yeah. Why do we need 77,000 of those new people every year in this state? Clay, that's I, know, I do that's not. That's what's happening. I do not know the answer. I, I, I know that again. I, I have challenged the the drugs are. I, I've challenged every elected official I can to defend this policy. And for the most part, the best I've ever gotten, say from uh, Adrian Garcia or, or D. A. Lycos, is this how we always do it. They they don't know the origin of these laws. They they refuse to investigate how they came about. They refuse to recognize that the futility of this effort. It's just how we've always done things. And, and that's, uh, that's well, got to stop. The way we do things was like when John Holmes uh, decided that everybody, along with the judges, needs a bond to get, get out of jail. Yeah. Last year we had 15. No cash bonds. I want to know who the hell was these 15 people? Yeah. How were they so great that they got what... How many people do we arrest in uh, Harris County every year? 10, 20, 30,000? Uh, yeah, 30,000 plus, I think. Look, the, the point of it is, in other counties, not all of them, but, you know, let's use Austin as an example and, and Houston as an example. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but out of, um, I'm, I'm going to say 35,000. I, I think in the year 2008, we had 15. PR bonds, personal recognizance bonds, where they, they allow you to go without posting a right. cash bond. Uh, so that's, you know, that's like 0.000%. You go to Austin, let's say again, 30,000 arrests, and they gave PR bonds for like 19,000. So, so the, the, the chance, the ability to get a PR bond in Houston is about one-tenth of one percent of what it is in Austin. This is the, a tie-in with the judges, and the, and, the, and the bonds companies, the bonds companies are the major contributors to the judges, and the judges make sure that the bonds and can stay in business. And the district attorney. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's what it's all about, is they have a closed group that supports them for re-elections. That's what the judges have. Uh, Ms. Lycos has the same damn thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, these are the people that directly benefit from the, these orders that the policemen have, uh, judges have right. on bonds, and if they don't give any of them out to anybody, who were the 15 that got them? Who were they related to? Well, that's a good Wh question. Whose who's daddy uh, was in, in, the, in town that uh, was important enough that this kid needs to get out of jail? I mean, let's face it, the best defense uh, of um, being arrested for marijuana is my father is a mayor, <laughs> my father is the governor. Yeah. Um, look at what happened to um, our uh, last governor, our mayor of uh, Houston, Bill White. Okay. His daughter. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. she was drunk, she was driving, mm -hmm. speeding, and had marijuana. Yeah. Dismissed. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's this, this brings to mind something else that I, I've been working with the good folks over at Texas Southern University. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been bringing a lot of focus to bear on this drug war. You know, uh, uh, they've done these three seminars. They're having another one that's coming uh, Friday and Saturday. It's going to be uh, at the uh, TSU library on the first floor. That's at 3100 Cleburne Street. Um, and Florence Coxum is, is the one who's been uh, she's produ producing, her. yeah, she's been producing these, and uh, this one is going to be uh, titled up the criminal justice system and post-traumatic stress disorder, the impact on our social structure, and the the mechanism of drug war has morphed and grown and and taken on a life of its own. I, I think perhaps the 
the people who first thought it up, you know, who thought maybe it was a good idea, maybe they, their mind was right. Maybe they, Anslinger? Well, before Anslinger, there, there were others, but maybe they thought they were doing the public some good. But uh, I tell you what, we, let's go ahead and take a break, and, and, and we'll pick up on this when we come back. Okay. All right? The whole idea of a drug-free America and zero tolerance really doesn't make much sense, does it? So it does make sense, however, to find ways to reduce the harms associated with drugs. And that's what I want to talk about. Better start thinking about whether it is really laws that make the difference or whether people use drugs or not. Al yes. Capone didn't shoot people because he was intoxicated. Right, exactly. Those people are not fighting over drugs. They're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this unholy symbiosis between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. War on drugs uh, isn't working, and that if anything, it's just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. This is Dean Becker of the Drug Truth Network. I urge you to listen to our programs on KPFT Radio, that's 90.1 FM in Houston, and available on the net at drugtruth.net. And the reasons why, there is no truth, no justice, no logic, no scientific fact, no moral clarity, no reason whatsoever for this drug war to continue. And it's going to take your involvement, and I urge you to become part of that solution. Okay, here we're back. Now, were you going to continue on? Yeah, I, I was just talking about how these public officials mm, at least pretend they don't know the origins of these laws. They pretend they don't recognize the racial disparity involved. They pretend that they uh, don't see the multi-generational impact of this on, on families and, and futures. Uh, this is, again, is how they make their mortgage payment. And I, I think, again, behind closed doors, when I don't have a microphone in front of some of these people, I'm not going to give names, but when, when, when we're just talking in the break room or something, they think more like me. They speak more like me. They are able to express themselves and recognize these failures more mm -hmm. like me. But, but when that camera is on or when that radio microphone is on, they take on a different persona. And I understand a couple of things out of this. One is they recognize that as just an individual person, they probably can't swing the cat. They probably can't make it happen. They can't make the change all by themselves. So therefore, they're unwilling to step even take out. that tiniest of steps, yes. uh, to step outside the norm. Uh, and, and I think, though, uh, they also recognize that there are dark forces that 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 need this drug war to continue, that uh, insist that it continue, and and uh, I, I'm not talking just about drug cartel, Shorty Guzman, the, the Sinaloa cartel. I'm not talking about the Crips and the Bloods. I'm talking about forces within uh, government. You mean like the private prison industry? Like the private prison industry, like the the prison unions guard, like the guards, like the. Do, do you know why the prison guards? are against medical marijuana? Well, it, it, it would reduce the ratio of nonviolent to violent prisoners. <laughs> and it would be a more unsafe work environment for them, and the retention would be a lot harder to keep uh, guards. I think you're right. I, I do. No, that's a statement that came out of our, right here in Houston. Yeah. Uh, 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 Houston, Huntsville. Well, I, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We're a group now of 50,000 supporters, about 120 of us, current and former law enforcement speak to, you know, Rotary Clubs and various organizations. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, we have, uh, over the years, 
tried to uh, you know, offer reward money for anybody from the other side, DEA, ONDCP, that mm -hmm. would come, come do a debate with us. You know, we'll do it at a college, a classroom yeah. or something. Uh, we'll, we'll donate the money to charity, whatever you want to do. And, and they have, well, mostly failed to respond, let alone to attend. They can't defend it. Right. Right. Um, the economics of it is crazy. I mean, billions of dollars are going to the people that we need to be protected from. Yeah, hundreds of billions, but yes. I mean, and it would be so easy to end it. Yeah. All you have to do is not have a reason for it to come across the border. Use it right here, grow it right here, tax it right here. Yeah. And yes, you're going to have these coyote type people that are going to have a grow out in the national forest. We still have moonshiners. Yeah. From 1932. <laughs> Well, and, and that's the point. Some, some folks say, well, if you legalize it for adults, that just means kids will get their hands on it more. And I say, no, they won't. I say, well, that's, if they do, it's the fault of the parents for not. I don't care right now uh, if you just have prescription pills. If you've got them where your children can get them, that's bad parenting. You need to have them in a locked cabinet somewhere, and you need to have a real good discussion with your child. But there's also the third factor, and that is, you cannot stop a determined child from doing anything they want to do. And, and there will I be those to, problems with a few. And if I have to lock up and hide my prescriptions, I've done something pretty damn wrong as a parent. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm just saying, if, if people want to say, but kids will get their hands on it, well, no. that's, that's the fault of the parent, not the kid, if they do. And remember, this is your program. It is a call-in program. The uh, number is on the screen right now, and we'd be more than happy to take your questions. Um, yeah, uh, let, me, let me pose a question for the night. Can you, dear viewer, name the benefit, what we have derived from this drug war that more than offsets all this horrible blowback? And if not, but then call in and tell us what we should do to, to change this equation. That sounds like a good, good way to go at it tonight. Yeah. Um, I just don't understand. I mean, the money is so great that every week there is more and more and more law enforcement getting arrested, oh, yeah. going to prison. Oh, yes. Um, there were three TSA agents, two in Connecticut, two um, state troopers in Florida, Last week, there was some 20 people that got arrested. Yeah. Why? TSA agents, are, we, we know, don't make that good of money. No. no. Um, you know, when people see that they're wor living on the edge of poverty, and they see that they can eh, fudge things around a little bit. Look the other way for 30 seconds. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, my kids are going to eat better. I'll, I'll have, be able to buy some furniture or whatever. Um, it's kind of hard to, to stop to think that people are really going to say, oh, no, even though I'm hungry. No, no, no. Well, Clay, that, I mean, this is so true. Now, you think about the economic climate we have right now and where it's going. And how many more people will reach that point of desperation? How many more people will be likely to take the offer of the no. silver or the lead and, 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 and get involved in the drug trade? It, it is a self-perpetuating machine of madness. And look also at these governors are looking for ways not to pay unemployment, not to uh, let people go to schools. Florida. They want um, welfare people drug tested before they can get benefits. They have to pay for their own test to see if they pass. Then they get reimbursed when they get their first check. Uh, yes, uh, and it uh, cost the state some couple of thousand dollars when they first tried it. Right. Yeah. And then we have South Carolina. The governor there, she wants uh, a drug test for everybody that's on unemployment. Right. And if you don't, if you don't pass the drug test, you don't get it. Well, the, 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 
when you say drug test, now, what this truthfully means is marijuana test. Because for uh, the vast majority of drugs, and I'm, I'm, I'm including heroin, cocaine, uh, amphetamines, and alcohol, within 48 hours, that's gone from yeah. your system. Whereas for marijuana, it can linger for up to 30 days. Oh, a long, long, if you got, like me, a little bit of this, it stays longer than 30 days. Well, and, and, and I guess the, the point I'm getting at here is that marijuana, the one drug that, let's, let's say it incapacitates you to some degree. It may slow your memory. It may slow your reflexes a tad. But it, it, it doesn't hold a candle to the incapacity one suffers from using alcohol. Uh, and, and yet, alcohol... I guess if you drank alcohol before you did your drug test and they were looking for alcohol, maybe you could fail. But uh, I, they, the likelihood is they're not even looking for alcohol when they do the test. Well, I agree with that. But I think that we have a good way that we can end the drug war right here. People that are getting arrested for it plead not guilty, trial by jury. If we had 7,700 cases of uh, simple possession that was going to jury trials, it would shut down the legal system. It would clog it and give it a heart attack. That's, that would be a simple way. Yeah. But, you know, it's getting 7,600 people, maybe for a couple of years, willing to go to jail for a year or six months. Yeah. And that's a tough road to go. I mean, what you... jail is so inhuman. People are being raped day and night. They're being beat up. They're being uh, traumatized. Taken, traumatized. Uh, d whatever they have, if there's somebody bigger uh, is going can take it from them, they do. Yeah. I mean, prison is uh, inhuman. It's it's a horrible thing to do to anybody. I don't know if you got a chance to hear the other night the tea baggers had a debate. And in the debate, uh, they were talking about, uh, you know, uh, I guess it was Governor Pyrie was uh, talking about the fact that he's killed some 240 men, executed them since he's been here. And, uh, and they say about two years ago, the one that he had uh, executed was innocent. And, 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 of course, they got, he got enormous cheers for that. And then I think a bit later, I believe it was Ron Paul, was talking about, uh, what about some youngster who doesn't buy into the new insurance program and he gets sick and he's dying do we just let him die and the crowd all cheered as if yeah let the sucker die and uh it was the tea baggers who were th saying that obama was going to institute death panels and and i guess they the tea baggers objected because they wanted to run the death panels <sighs> Now, you, you were talking about the, the cop corruption, you know, for, for years, I, and I need to get back to it. Phil Smith with uh, Drug War Chronicle uh, mm -hmm. would, would provide me a weekly segment. We called it the Corrupt Cop Story of the Week. Yep. And it w usually wasn't a cop. It was about 6, 7, 20, oh. as you say. Uh, and and this, is, this is like, uh, you know, leaning into the wind. You know, uh, if the wind's blowing, you don't really notice it after a while. You're just leaning. Mm -hmm. And that's what people are doing in, in regards to this corruption by cop, if you will, is that, oh, well, it's, it's just part of it. It's going to be okay. It's only a few of them. But the fact of the matter is if we were able to take those thousands of corrupt cops and have that story hit the paper in one day, the drug war would be over. But it's, it's like we, we're willing to accept a little bit of corruption in the name of saving little Johnny from getting his hands on a joint. The way you save little Johnny by getting his hands on a joint is by legalizing it and regulating it and dispensing it properly. Yeah, and uh, many folks don't think about this, that uh, adults have access, children will get it easier. I don't think so because the truth of the matter is once we legalize drugs, there will be so much room in prison to hold anybody who would dare sell drugs to our children. It'd be ridiculous. Uh, anybody who wanted to take that chance, and if I'm on the jury, I'll convict them with you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, we've got to protect our children. But why should adults be constrained, imprisoned, killed, like Tom Croslin and Raleigh Rome, because they choose to use a, a plant product that's not embraced by the federal government? You know, we can Im import hemp 
You can't grow it here. <laughs> we can sell the products, benefit from the plant itself, but we can't grow it. It's a bad, evil plant. It's uh, so preposterous. I don't even know how to answer that one, Clay. But, you know, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is we have, over the years, been fed this bag of lies, this, this quasi-religious bullshit that, uh, you know, stands as government, uh, that, that stands as, uh, you know, legitimate. And, and the fact of the matter is, let's reach back. I, I started talking about this earlier. Where did these drug laws come from? We, we talked about it. It was to quash the Mexicans. It was to quash the, yeah. the, the, the black community. It, uh, the original one, 1909, the uh, Opium Exclusion Act mm -hmm. was the first federal law, and it went after opium smokers. And that wasn't the white lady drinking the opium in her oh, laudanum. No, that was the Chinese. That was the Chinese, the leftovers from building the railroads across America and so right. forth. And uh, you know I, I think we got a call. Hello, caller. Okay. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, Clay. It's Lance. Hey, Lance. How, how are, are you, buddy? Pretty good. I mean, uh, Dean, it's been a long time. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. What's up? Oh, I've got to call and talk about this little case I have going right now. Um, well, let's talk about it. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm actually on probation for possession right now and uh, experiencing the other side of things. That for a long time, you know, I stood up and hollered against, and um, I, it's been an interesting uh, experience. Now, I was listening to what Clay said about, um, you know, if everybody, you know, tried to go trial by jury. You know, I actually talked to my lawyer when I went through this case about that. Uh, it was in Nacogdoches County, um, and uh, in that city there, you know, it's a, a, a college town, so. He said that the possibilities of getting a jury that was sympathetic was actually pretty good. But the problem was the money involved, and, and, and there was no way I would, know, would be able to uh, uh, afford that. So if a plan to get you know, everybody to stand up and, and fight it by jury to, to see it, to, if you could get a sympathetic jury isn't so much someone who's willing to spend the time in jail. But it's more that you need lawyers willing to donate the time and, and or at least some type of fund uh, to help people fight it. Well, Lance, this is uh, my idea is more of a thing that we load the jails. We don't try to avoid it. Uh, we don't try to beat the charge. We can go up for our trial jury and have a public defender. And the worst uh, defense that you get just puts more and more pressure on the state. That, you know, that's true. and uh, uh, It's a tough way to go. I mean... It, it's a real tough way to go because from my experience at the uh, uh, probation office that I've been in, it's on a pretty bad side of town. And it seems to me that what we really have is more of a convex of two problems. A really bad law and poverty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and everything really feeds into each other. Um, well, and uh, if and I could, over again. Uh, the, the thing that uh, strikes me is that it's not just drug crimes. I, I had a talk with that uh, sheriff's deputy out there in California. He says that out there it's not just drug crimes. It's about 95% of all crimes are plea bargain these days. Yeah, and, that's exactly right. And, and I basically did the same thing too. To uh, uh, It was just, I, you know, I have a family, I have two kids and, and a wife, and I gotta feed them, and, and to take the chance was to, was more than what the oh. plea bargain. Okay. Yeah, but you're, you're not in the situation that I was talking about. You've right. got the family, you've got the kids, um, you got the home, you got all that stuff. That's more for people that uh, really don't have too much to lose. Yeah. Well, how would you get the message to, like, so the group of people I see on a on a constant basis at this probation office, they're not watching drugs, crimes, and politics. They're not listening to KPFT, uh, you know. And well, they're, they're that's excellent. that's the problem that we have to kind of um, figure out because there's a little bit of disconnect on on trying to get it done. Well, it's just an idea at this point. 
No, I, I think it's actually a really great idea. Uh, it, what's great, I mean, it, it's a peaceful resistance, and, and that's the only one that really gets any real change in history. But anyways, I just wanted to call and, and like, talk about that. All righty. Thanks, Thanks for the call, Lance. Have a good one. You too. Uh, uh, you know, Lance has thought of doing what's right for his circumstance. You know, that's yes. what everybody has to has do in the long run. And I, it takes me back to when I was younger. I was oh, 21, 22. I'm driving down the road, going home for the evening after work. I see a couple of my buddies. They're out there on the road in front of me. They're hitchhiking. I put, what's going on, guys? They got a suitcase. They say, yeah, we need to ride. They get in the car. Less than a block later, my car was stopped by the cops. What was in the suitcase was drugs they had stolen from a drugstore a couple of nights before. Uh, I'm suddenly faced with the prospect of either taking the probation they're offering or going to trial to prove my innocence. And I, I promise you, I was innocent, but I took the five years probation. This was 1971 in Harris County, no. and I would have gotten 10, 20 years for that suitcase full of drugs. So I, I took what they were given. Uh, he says we got another call. Hello, caller. Uh huh. You're on the air. Okay. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. good. What's on your mind? All right. Um, I want to talk about the issue of the uh, plans y'all was talking about earlier uh, on legalizing and helping helping out on taxes and things like that. Um, the tobacco, the the plant, the tobacco plant grows just like the cannabis plant. And when they break it down and everything, you smoke the cigarette. And if you ain't never smoked a cigarette before, and you smoke it too hard and you start coughing and getting dizzy and sick and whatever, the same is for the cannabis plant. It's grown, and it, it don't have the near effects of tobacco. No nicotine. No, yeah, no, it don't have no nicotine. It's, it's been proven to heal my uncle's on chemotherapy. And uh, it helped him be able to eat so he can stay, try to stay healthy. So Sleep and stay healthy, you bet. Yeah, so that, that's all I was just calling to see. You. No, no, wait, wait, thank you wait. for that. Uh, could I ask you something, sir? Uh -huh. You know, you say you're, it helped your uncle to thrive. I mean, is he doing okay or has he passed on? or? No, nah, he's still alive. He, he's still alive? He actually, his numbers went down on the, um, on the chemo that he's doing. Well, it's wonderful news. You know, I, I spoke to a, a, a group out in California. They're called WAM, uh, Women's Organization for Medical Marijuana. And they have, they are the most serious, if you will, of the medical marijuana dispensaries. They've had over 200 of their members die, you know, over the last, well, 15 years. But they, they, uh, they find that it, it helps relieve, as you say, for nausea. It helps you get some sleep, some rest. It helps you relax. And if nothing else, maybe you get a little euphoria. And I see nothing wrong with a little euphoria for somebody who's, who's yeah. got cancer. You know, I use marijuana every day. I use it from the time I wake up until the time I go to sleep. If I smoke, I probably smoke four or five grams a day. Yeah. Um, without it, I'd be as skinny as my little finger. Yeah. Um, I would have spasticity so bad couldn't stay in your chair. I couldn't stay in my chair. And if they want to come and arrest me for relieving medical conditions, be my guest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, why, why the government making it so hard? I mean, what's, what's the problem? It's been years and be, decades. Because most black people are poor, and the prison industry gets to have black people in, in jail for nonviolent offenses, and you help um, build their coffers full of money. Uh, that's the problem. For every white person that goes to jail for m marijuana, there's 15 black people. There's six Hispanic people. That's the problem. Yeah. It is racially motivated. It and wasn't, implemented. And, and it was implemented. Uh, Henry Anslinger, Dennis Anslinger? Harry J. Harry J. Uh, Anslinger, he testified in front of Congress, and he tells these stories of black men playing voodoo music, smoking this devil weed, and a white girl walks by, and now she's pregnant, she couldn't resist the, the music marijuana. or the marijuana, and that's the reason that marijuana is against the law, because it was lied about 
when it was first made into a law. Hey, uh, caller, could, could, and I want to tell everybody this again. I want to remind you folks that uh, starting Friday and Saturday at uh, Texas Southern University, they're holding a two-day seminar. They're going to explore the evolution of the prison system, uh, prison expansion, prison industrial complex, racial disparities, the prison subculture, the taxpayer dollars, all of the ramifications of this. And uh, I urge you to call Florence Coxum at 713-732-6191. Uh, they're offering continuing education credits as well. And uh, it's the criminal justice system and post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, and I, I do think our black community needs to investigate and learn about the laws of marijuana and why they're there. And I think that the black portion of our society would raise up in arms. Well, and I, they're beginning to. I, I think around the country, certainly at Texas Southern, they're beginning to recognize the, the, the disparity, the, the outright inequity of this whole thing. Uh, can I t uh, also alert folks this coming Sunday uh, on my show on uh, KPFT, which is 90.1 FM. You can tune in at 6.30 p.m. Uh, and uh, the, our first uh, half hour will be uh, interviews I did with the folks that attended and worked at Rainbow Farm where Tom Cross yeah. and Raleigh Rome were gunned down. That's at 6.30. And then at 7 o'clock, I'll be talking, doing a live interview with Deborah Small with Break the Chains, and she worked with Texas Southern University, oh, I think five, six years ago, helped bring a seminar here where uh, uh, Texas Senator Whitmire was seen on stage crying, almost as if he were sorry for the state of our laws and its impact on the black community. Um, but uh, again, that's, uh, and you can hear hundreds of my shows by going to drugtruth.net, I guess that's been online, but it's time to participate. It's time to become full citizens. It's time well, to quit letting others carry the weight. What we need to do, the people out there, you want to help and get this thing done, make an appointment and go see your state representative. Make an appointment and go see your state senator. Uh, sit down, take five minutes, write two paragraphs on why you think the drug war should be ended. Mail it, put a stamp on it, address it, put it in an envelope, and send it. That one note that somebody takes the time, sits down, and writes it out longhand, these representatives have all told me that one of them is worth a thousand emails. Yeah, or a hundred phone calls. Or, yes. Yeah, yeah. That one, that's, we need to start uniting and trying to do something to end it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's, I'm at the point that I think direct action is need, needs to start happening. People are willing to start going to jail. People are willing to get on juries, and hopefully they're on a, a drug charge, and if it's a low person okay. in the... Is this hung up, or...? Yes, it... No, it's not. Okay. All right, it I, I looks like we're running out of time here. I, I just want to say thanks, Clay, for bringing me on. And uh, to you out there watching, look, you know the answer. You, you're afraid to act upon it because this thing has been beat into our heads. Uh, the cops used to try to beat it out of my head, I think, whatever, years back. And if you've uh, endured that, some of that post-traumatic stress like me, uh, maybe you're unwilling, but I finally had enough and said, I'm not going to take it anymore. And... Uh, you know, I guess that's it. Uh, and tomorrow night on uh, West Gray Cafe at 7 o'clock, we have our normal meeting. Uh, last month, there was about 17 people there. It was a good meeting, a good turnout. Come on out, get involved, and see what we can do. Um, join us next time on Drugs, Crime, and Politics. private prisons that have now hired lobbyists to go get minimum mandatory venues. Uh, I began to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. Damn prohibition, which can only mean one thing. Legalize drugs. Legalize all.